It is good to gather and come to shout the name of our Lord. And I noticed some of you were trying to find space as you came in. It's been a long time since we had to make room for people. It's a good feeling. So I'm glad we make room for you and glad that you're here to worship with us. As I mentioned, uh, today's going to be a little bit different than usual. I mean, I'm going to need this. The magic board. Yeah. If you're guests with us or visiting, typically what we do is uh, we're, we're in a series on the Gospel of Mark called Following the King. We're taking a break from that series just for this weekend, as I mentioned at the outset, to do three things. To look back at what God has done, to take stock of where we are now, and to look forward. In this section, we want to take stock of where we are. It's a good thing to look back. It's a good thing to remember. In fact, the Bible tells us that remembering is a spiritual discipline. Remember, we're forgetful people. We forget who God is. We forget who we are because of his grace. And so it's good to remember, individually and collectively, to tell the stories and remember the faithfulness of our God. It's also good for us to press pause and take stock of where are we? How are we doing as a church? How are you doing individually? We're not all in the same place. Some of you uh, are excited about things, quote unquote, getting back to normal. Others of us are still grieving, struggling. But as a church family, how are we doing? There's a lot of studies, you may not know this, there's a lot of studies being done right now about the church in the post-COVID world. And not all the data is encouraging, quite frankly. And I, I think that it's going to take some time to sort all that out and make sense of what that means. But we're not talking about the church in, the, in America necessarily or the church in the world. We're talking about this church, our church. Is Chapel Street Church in a healthy place? And if we, if we are, how do we know that? How do we measure that? Well, typically, pastors and church leaders have measured health in pr two primary ways. You probably can guess. Who shows up and who gives money? And, and those things matter. That's, they're good to count. But they're not the only things that count and not the only metrics that tell about the health of a church. So we're going to look at our, our church. I'm going to share some information with you. And we know we're a large church across four campuses. And perhaps you don't always know. Maybe you just trust or maybe you wonder, how are we doing? We're going to look at some, some data that might give us a picture of how we're doing, financially, organizationally, and spiritually, missionally. So first, financially. How are we doing financially? Now, those of you that like numbers, you're going to get excited. Others of you, uh, maybe that struggle in math like I did, your eyes are going to glaze over. Don't do that, because these numbers matter, and they, and they honor God. Over the last two years, we have seen more generosity and, than ever before in the history of our church. I want to pause there. Over the last two years, during a global pandemic, with so much uncertainty, we've seen more generosity than ever before in the history of our church. Praise God. And thank you to so many of you. I want you to know that's not lost on us as church leaders. Inside this yellow dotted line, that's money given in over the last two years. Outside those four uh, little icons around the perimeter, that's money given out over the last two years. Let me put this on the right color because we can't have red. Because we're not in the red. So this is money given out over the last two years. Over the last two years, we have given away more than $2 million outside of our walls to the work of God in our local and global partners. That's unprecedented. This thing called Serve the World up here in the upper left-hand corner. I remember years ago when our missions budget used to be part of our general fund budget, we were always wrestling with how much of our missions budget should we give away. And we decided to take it out of our regular general fund budget and, and make a different category called Serve the World, giving to the work of God locally and globally, separate from our general fund budget. We were nervous. Oh, no. Would it reduce the amount of money we give to missions? It's exponentially increased it. It's remarkable to see what God is doing. In the lower uh, right-hand corner, neighborhood church generosity. This refers to the fact that this past December, our church family, m many of you, were more generous than we had expected or planned. Far more generous in one month, the single largest month in the history of the church. So we decided before God, we should be more generous than we had planned. And so we picked uh, several local churches, local in terms of in our area and local churches in other parts of the country and world to give money to. I would call these pastors and say, what do you need? And they thought I was asking, how can we pray for you? Which we did. We are praying for them. How fun and exciting and what a blessing it was for me to be the voice to say, we want to bless you. We want to give you a gift to meet that need. They weren't even asking for it, but they were praying about it. Your generosity is producing that. I wanted to tell you that story. And one of the healthiest metrics is this. Over the last two years, 484 people for the first time making a financial contribution to the work of God here. 
If that's you, thank you. Your giving honors God, and it's making a difference around the world and right here. Now, for th to those of you who are faithful givers, again, thank you. It really is making a huge difference. Sometimes you look at big numbers like this and you think, well, what, what difference does, I don't have those kind of resources, what difference does my gift make? These two, two million dollars given away, meeting our general fund budget, all of these things, that's the result of the collective people of God in this community being generous. But I like to think of our generosity in terms of a, a, step, a stair step ladder, if you go to the next slide there. You know, we're all in process spiritually. And Jesus talked a lot about money. And for some of us, some of you, you're here, you're new, you're, you're exploring who, what we're about, but you've never given. And that's okay, but maybe for you, it's just the first gift, the first time. Take the first step and make a gift to the work of God. And maybe it's not here, maybe it's somewhere else that you're passionate about that God is moving. But to take the first step in giving out of all that God has blessed you with. And for many of you, you give when it occurs to you. You give when you think about it. But it's somewhat random and somewhat dependent on what you're paying attention to. And so the next step for you would be to become consistent. To consistently give out of the resources God has blessed you with to his work here and around the world. And then some of you are consistent givers. You give online, electronically, like me and my family, as we do. But perhaps for you, it's to think more prayerfully and intentionally about how much and to become what we call a proportional giver. As a friend of mine likes to say, it's, the question is not how much of my money am I gonna give to the work of God, it's how much of God's money am I gonna keep for myself. He owns it all, and he blesses us. And then finally, I think this is where we all want to be, and where God desires us to be, is to become joyful and extravagant givers. I've told this story before, but I always marvel at a friend of mine years ago who said, you know, Jeff, when my wife and I got married, we decided to give 10% of our income away to the work of God, as God instructs us, and we have increased that 1% a year for the last 49 years. Whoa! <laughs> he said, we're having the time of our lives giving money away to the work of God. So I don't know where you are, but my encouragement would be that's between you and the Lord, and this is not a, a, a plea, it's simply an encouragement to you. Take the next step wherever you find yourself for you and your family. There's more to say there, but I think I can tell you with great confidence and, and gratitude to God that financially speaking, we're in a very healthy place. Now let's look at our, our church organizationally. Now, the church is not an organization. It's not a business, it's not a corporation. It, it is a spiritual body of which Jesus Christ himself is the head and we are members of his body. Paul uses that analogy, right? Eye, hand, foot, I see some big toes out there, right? We're all members of the body of Christ and necessary. But it is people coming together, being organized for a purpose. Now, Jesus is the most important part of the church and we as members of his body. But I wanna to talk to you about two areas of the church that we don't talk often about and I think it's important for you to know. Our staff and our church board. First, our staff. I am so profoundly grateful for these 67 men and women, full and part-time staff members over the last two years. They have innovated and prayed and shouldered such a weight. You know, people often come to me and say thank you for things that I had nothing to do with. Our staff did. And I just say, you're welcome. Right? Like yesterday, right here at Kessler Campus, 15 or 1,600 people coming for the Easter extravaganza. Becky and her team did an incredible job, an army of volunteers. People are walking out with tears thanking me. And all I'm doing is standing there with a green shirt going, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> it's our staff. They do such an incredible job. They're so humble, so faithful, so talented. If you see a staff member today or in the weeks ahead, just tell them that you're praying for them and you're grateful for them. I know that I am. And in a season when many churches have had to cut staff or put a freeze on hiring, we've been able to add 23 new staff. The net gain of four staff to our, our family. Younger, talented, excited individuals for the work of God here. So thank you to our staff. Pray for the staff. I, I have leaned on them and am grateful for them in ways that it's hard for me to express. Next, our church board. I don't really, if we go to the next slide there. Oh yeah, let me tell you about, go back to that one. I'll talk about these guys and, and Jen. You know what I do as a lead pastor? This makes up our executive team. Pastor John and, and Abe Doncel. John is our executive pastor of ministries. So men's, women's, children's, uh, and, and, and uh, our serve the world, all this flows up to John. 
He oversees that side of, the, of, of our operations. And Abe Donseld, Executive Director of Operations, he oversees facilities, finance, communications, all the non-ministry stuff that makes it all run so smoothly. He does an amazing job with his teams. And Jen Gomo is the head of HR. She oversees our, our policies, our hiring policies, our talent development, re recruiting people, training people. She does an incredible job. Okay, next. I am so profoundly grateful for these men and women on the screen. They're not staff. They don't get paid. They give up their time. They're, they are my bosses. Well, Jesus is my boss, but he's using these people to lead me. As I seek to lead our staff, to shepherd all of you. I, I have leaned on them. We've had so many emergency Zoom call meetings. How are we gonna respond to this crisis? How are we gonna handle this issue in our culture? They pray for me, they challenge me, they encourage me. And I don't, they don't get a lot of credit. They don't ask for it. But I want you to see their names and faces so that you know them. They're elected by our church membership. Uh, they serve on three-year terms. They're not people that I appoint, but I am so grateful. I'm so dependent on, on them in so many ways. I want you to know who they are so you can see them and pray for them and thank God for them as I do. So organizationally, there's more that we could say. But we're not a perfect church. There's no such thing as a perfect church. Do you know why there's no such thing as a perfect church? Because people are in churches. And if you find a perfect church, you should not go there because you'll be the one to mess it up, right? <laughs> we're, a, we're a collection of broken people doing the best we can and depending on God's grace. But I can tell you with great, great gratitude and confidence that organizationally, we're in a healthy place. Let's look at how we're doing spiritually or missionally. We could spend hours telling stories about people experiencing God's grace, growing in faith, and making an impact. That's the way we talk about the life that Jesus wants us to live around here. But I want to look at a few numbers that are connected to those stories to give you a picture. We could fill all of our time doing this. This is really just a, intended to be a snapshot of a few highlights. Over the last two years, during a global pandemic, 257 people have gone through Rooted. This is the 10-week course that we really believe in that helps people understand the life of Christ in our context. And many of you have been through Rooted, hundreds before the pandemic, and we're do people are in it right now. And if you're looking for the next step period where you want to get connected and really begin to grow, I would encourage you, reach out to Pastor Joe Scavato and join a Rooted group. It's worth it. Many of these people were meeting when we could not meet in person. There were Zoom rooted groups that were growing in Christ together and they wanted to have a baptism service so they invited me over to a, a Gretchen's pool and with masks on we did a baptism service in her backyard during the pandemic in her pool because God was working even online. Speaking of online, we had never streamed a service in the history of our church before ever before the pandemic, before it's two years ago. We had planned to do our first one at Easter 2020 and then the world shut down we had to do it a month early. Our, our tech teams and our production teams scrambled to, to get prepared, and they have done an amazing job over the last two years. I talked to many people who t I meet out in the community who say, hey, we're still watching, or who thank me because they can't come in person for health reasons or they're shut in, and they say, the online services are a lifeline to us. Please don't stop doing that. And so if you're watching this and that's you, don't worry, we're not stopping. <laughs> now, I would just say this. Online worship services are not a replacement for in-person. They never will be but they are a very good supplement to that and God is using that. Many of these new connections, 3,000 new connections to Chapel Street Church found us online first. Many, many of them. I, I watched, I got a sense for who, this, who you are as a church and then we came in person. God is using that in ways we've never seen before. And then we launched a campus during a global pandemic, which at times we wondered, are we crazy? Well. Paul says we are fools for Christ, so maybe we are, right? But I had pastor friends that said, you're launching a campus, are you sure that's the right time? And God is blessing it. There have been challenges, but God is blessing that. It's growing. I, meet, I talk to people who are new there every week. So we could say a lot more about this, but God is on the move here. And that's, again, I hope you don't hear this as, look at, look at how great Chapel Street is. That is not the intent. The intent is to answer the question, how are we doing? How are we doing as a church? To give us, as church, as members of God's body here, a glimpse of how we're doing. For the purpose of what he wants to do in us. God doesn't bless his people just for their own benefit. But for his glory and purpose in the world, which we'll talk about in a few moments.
Last, if we go to this slide, I like to think of our church in, in four buckets. I'm a visual learner, maybe you'll enjoy this. I'm gonna draw some buckets and you think about which bucket you're in. Over the last two years, there are people that have become more engaged, more engaged in their faith, more connected to Christ, more on mission in their life, more loving toward their neighbors, more in digging into the word of God, and more engaged with the work of God in the local church. Maybe that's you, I know it's many of you. Way to go, keep it up, we're cheering you on. There are also people over the last two years in our church family who have become less engaged. They're not gone, they haven't walked away from faith or church, it's just been hard. They're less dialed in. They, maybe there's some, some disappointment and some loss and they're struggling with their faith and they're questioning God. Maybe you've just drifted a bit off mission in your life and it's just been hard. You still believe, you still care, but you're less engaged than you were. Maybe God is drawing you back in. I know that's, I talk to many, I know that's many of us. And then the third bucket is, there are people in our church that, well, they're not here anymore because this bucket represents those, this is an empty bucket, who are gone. Now that handle's gonna bother me. <laughs> but I'll leave it right now. They were here. And over the last two years, they, they, they're gone. And, and no doubt, there's been a great exodus. People have moved in the country. It seems like most of them have gone to Nashville or Florida. So if you're watching from Nashville, Florida, hey, we missed you, we see you. Well, you see us, right? That's happened. Some have shifted churches, and that's okay. There are, there are good reasons to change churches. That's not all bad. But for some people, they've just drifted away. The last two years have been so hard and it's pressed on maybe their faith wasn't solid. It wasn't rooted deep in the gospel and they've just drifted from God and from the community of faith. Maybe you know some of those people. Maybe you should pray for them and reach out to them. And the fourth are those who are new. And some in this bucket are here because they were in another church and they've come here and they're growing in their faith. And by the way, if people leave Chapel Street to go to another church and they're growing in their faith and loving Christ, praise God. God's kingdom is big. If people leave another church and come here and they're growing in their faith and on mission, praise God. We're not competing over the same few people. We're trying to reach a world that's in desperate need of the gospel. So the most exciting part of this is those who two years ago did not know Jesus, did not have a relationship with God, did not have a church family, and now they do. And this is a bucket that's growing and it's exciting. So just to wrap this up, go to that last slide. How are we doing? Is Chapel Street Church a healthy church? By no means are we a perfect church. We, are, we have flaws, we have challenges, we have issues, and God wants to grow us. The greatest challenge for us, quite frankly, is, to be, is that we don't become comfortable and secure in our comfort and security based on where we live and the blessings God has given us. But I can tell you, with humility and gratitude to God, yeah, God has blessed us. We're in a healthy place. We have an opportunity and responsibility for what to do with that, which we'll talk about in a few moments. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you for the way that you have blessed us. Thank you for your faithfulness over the last two years and in every season, all our lives you've been faithful. But we, acutely, we look back over two years and we see your faithful hand. And we look at where we are right now as a church family and frankly, God, it's overwhelming how good you've been to us. Forgive us for taking that for granted. Open our eyes that we might see what you wanna do in us and through us as we move into the future. We praise you, Jesus, and we thank you. Amen. great faithfulness.
You be seated. It's my my wife's favorite hymn. We sung it at my wedding, and so I always get a little, a little emotional singing that song. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine and ten thousand beside. The hymn says. Strength for today. We've looked at that and bright hope for tomorrow. What what is the bright hope for tomorrow for the church? So I talk in the culture right now about getting back to normal. I understand that, and I will admit that I've enjoyed watching the NCAA March Madness tournament with fans in the arenas, and feels more like normal again. I like that. Getting back to school, getting back to work, getting back to life as we used to know it, but I'm not sure as it relates to the church that getting back to normal ought to be the goal. I think perhaps God has something better for us than just getting back to business as usual. I think he wants something more for us. Some of you will know the story in Matthew 16 when Jesus is with his disciples and he asks them, what are the, who do the people say that I am? It's his way of saying, what's the word on the street about me? And they respond, well, some think you're John the Baptist, which is interesting because John the Baptist has already been killed. Come back to life. Some think you're Elijah. Some think you're one of the prophets. Basically, they don't really know, but there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of buzz about you, Jesus, and a lot of opinions, but they're not exactly sure who you are. And then Jesus makes it personal. Do you remember this? What about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter being Peter speaks up. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Jesus says, bingo. He doesn't say bingo, it's not in the Bible, right? But he says, you got it right. Exactly right. And then he says something remarkable. He says, and you're blessed, not because you're so smart and you figured it out, because you didn't get this on your own. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. This is spiritual knowledge. To know me, to know who I am, to understand my identity and my mission in the world is not something that a human mind just figures out on its own. God opens our eyes. And then Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. And I will, you are now Peter, he says. The rock, that's what his name means. And on this rock, not Peter himself, but the rock of his confession in Jesus Christ, I'll build my church. Jesus uses this question about his identity. Well, who do the people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And it's Peter's confession to talk about his church. I will build my church. And then he says something that you may remember. And the what? And the gates of? Oh, nobody likes to say the word hell out loud in church, right? And the gates of? Will not prevail. I want to pause on that phrase. Jesus says, I, he, will build his church. On what Peter has just said is true, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the rock. He is the foundation on which the church is built. Chapel Street Church and any church that proclaims the name of Jesus and preaches the gospel and the the word of God, that's the church Christ is building in the world. Looks different in different places. We all come together and make up his church. He's going to build it. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Who has the gates? The gates of? I know, I'll make you say it again. The gates of? Hell! Hell! Hell has the gates. We think of heaven as the gated community, right? The pearly gates. We think of the church as the gated community. Keep all the bad people out and the good, nice people like us in, right? That is not God's vision for the church at all. His vision for the church is not people that look like me, vote like me, walk like me, talk like me, live near me, my people, inside of my holy huddle. That's a corruption in our our country that we've made of the church. Jesus' vision for the church is something he's building that is going to be kicking down gates, apparently. Advancing in the kingdom. Knocking down walls. Where are the gates of hell? Interestingly, Jesus said this while he was in a place in Caesarea Philippi at the mouth of a cave that they refer to as the gates of hell. Like the literal manifestation of this imaginary first century mind of The forces of evil in the world. That's what he means. He's talking about the the powers of darkness in the world. And it's not hard to find them, is it? Just look at your social media feed, turn on the news. The places where people are oppressed and exploited and harmed. All around the world. Right next door. The people of God should be going there. Should be praying about that should care about what God, what's, what God wants to do there. 
Every tribe, nation, tongue, race, culture, creed come together redeemed by the blood of Jesus, brought into his family as his church, and then sent into the world. By the way, when Jesus says, I'll build my church, that's the first place the word church shows up in the New Testament. And do you know what the Greek word is? The word ekklesia. The, the root word of that is the Greek word kaleo. It means to be called. So the church are those people who are called out of the world. God calls his people out of the world, changes us by his grace, and then sends us back into the world. To, be, to belong to the church is to be both called and sent. Called out and sent to. That's the church. So as we think about the future, perhaps you're expecting some grand vision. I'm not gonna talk to you about how many campuses. I'm not gonna talk to you about numbers and growth. I wanna talk to you about what I believe God wants for your heart. What are we getting back to? What's he after? Why these remarkable blessings financially and spiritually and missionally and organizationally? Not because we deserve it. Not even because we've done things right. We certainly have it, haven't at times. But because God wants to do something in us. He wants to do something in the world through us. If you belong to Jesus, meaning you've trusted him for the forgiveness of your sins, you've turned over your life, doesn't mean you're perfect or you have it all together and none of us do. And maybe you're sitting here going, ah, sent to the world, I can hardly hold my own life and family together. Do you know what the very... You know what the best thing you have to offer to a broken world is? Your own relationship with God. Remember back to our series in, in Mark, Mark 10. He's, Jesus has asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? The greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The best thing for you, like you, the first order of business for you and for me, for all of us, is to get right with Jesus. To come back to true north and get on mission and on center in my life. Maybe you're in that bucket of less engaged or drifted. And your job in the post-pandemic world, whatever that means, is to get your heart right before God. And he's not arms crossed going, when will you figure this out? His arms wide open, come to me. I have infinite grace for the things you can't be forgiven. I have infinite love. And I've got so much more for you. We've been conditioned in our culture, haven't we, to be a little fearful, to be a little nervous, to think of the world as a threatening place, to think of each other as potential infectors. Like we've been conditioned to be fearful of one another. And I'm not declaring anything over. That's beyond my pay grade. I don't know what the future holds, but I know the God who's faithful and good. And I know that you cannot follow Jesus in this world as part of his church with a posture of fear and skepticism. You just can't do it. God doesn't send you into the world to be nervous, fearful people who only hang out with each other. It will make no difference. So the challenge for each of you first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and strength. And then Jesus says, the second's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. One flows from the other. I'll leave you with this question. Who do you need to move toward? We've been moving away from each other for a long time, nervous about one another. Who has God put on your mind and your heart that he's asking you to move toward in love, in grace? That's what it means to be the church. Our best effort, all the programs you saw, all the numbers, all that is is just some, some attempt to measure what it means to live out our mission on our, on our streets. Do you know what the word Chapel Street, where you got the name from? You might know this. There's no street named Chapel Street that we're on. None of our campuses is on Chapel Street. Why do we call ourselves Chapel Street Church? A chapel is a small house of worship connected to a larger whole. That's your life. Every house, a chapel on its street. Every life, a chapel where God has placed you. A place of grace, faith, and impact on your street, in your neighborhood, in your school, at work. That's what it means to be the church. Not get back to normal. If normal means going through the motions, then I don't think God wants us to get back to normal at all. I think he wants to get back to him, to his love, to his grace, to being the called out ones and the sent ones. We're gonna sing one last worship song together and then I'm gonna leave you as you go. You're gonna be given a bag. That's an encouragement to you. 
it's a challenge to you to be just that, a chapel on your street. Uh, it's, a, it's a bag to encourage you to pray, how to prayer walk your neighborhood, things that you can share, invitation cards for Easter, as you pray about who, who God do I need to move toward in love. Let's pray. Father, you have blessed us that we might be a blessing. Forgive us for thinking that the blessings you poured out on us individually as families and as a church family are for our own sake. They are not. Remind us, Lord, that we do not exist for our own benefit, but for the benefit of our neighbors. We're not here for ourselves, but for your glory and the sake of the world. Thank you for the way that you poured out your grace and blessings and equipped us. Remind us that when we feel unequal to the task or unworthy, remind us that it's true, apart from you, we are unworthy. You alone are worthy, and yet you've given us all we need. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.